Welcome everyone to the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Programs Workshop entitled Health Financing in the Time of Pandemics. Today's workshop will focus on health financing during difficult times such as this COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen firsthand the devastating impact the pandemic has had on every country's health and economic systems. And we know that no country's economic recovery can be sustained without forward thinking and strategic investments in supporting health and economic recovery. As the report of the G20 high level independent panel, panel on financing the global commons for pandemic preparedness and response. And yes, that is the title of the report. As that report points out, Scaling up pandemic preparedness cannot wait until the pandemic is over. Collectively, we must bet, get better at mobilizing financial, scientific, technological resources to reduce the risk of future pandemics and the human and economic damage they bring. We must strengthen global governance and mobilize greater and more sustained investments in global public goods, including a more robust global health infrastructure, a more, more resilient health systems, and even better, be more prepared to support the clinical and public health workforce. Here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and across the, Har the entire Harvard campus, we know that to enable more and effective global response to pandemic, and to other threats, we must support and empower nurses and midwives to lead crucial efforts to address health issues such as malaria, TB, immunization programs, and, and the control, prevention, and management of chronic non-communicable diseases. With enough stature, tools, and training, nurses and midwives can and will bring forth transformational improvements in the global health security agenda. However, we do have to enable the mindset shift to truly position this workforce for global population health leadership. What do we need to do to make this happen? I would argue that we must be proactive and that we must support interprofessional and multidisciplinary training to support nursing and midwifery leadership in developing and implementing agile, domestic, regional, and globally networked health systems that are resilient to pandemic threats, as well as other threats. To do this, we must make the sorts of investments, those strategic investments, that the G20 High Level Independent Panel proposes. So today, we are going to hear from Dr. Christoph Kowalski, Global Lead at the World Bank Group. At the World Bank Group, Dr. Kowalski directs knowledge initiatives to enhance the World Bank's support to country reforms and to inform the global policy debate on financing for health. He plays a very important role in capital fund flows for financing health on a global scale. He has advised governments at all stages of development in the design and the implementation of health financing and health systems reform. He has researched and written on health financing and systems issues and contributed to global health initiatives with the Commission of Macroeconomics and Health. Following his keynote, Dr. Stephanie Ferguson will moderate a, co a conversation on strategies for dealing with health recovery and health financing in times of pandemic. And she will do this with Minister Peggy Vado, Minister of Health of Seychelles, and with Naima um, Al Jazeera from the WHO, a representative of Egypt. And that is if she is able to join us given the technical difficulties that are being experienced in her region. If, doc, if, if, if Representative Al Gasser is not available, the panel discussion will include Dr. David Benton. The conversation that will follow 
will be a discussion about our new program, the Harvard Global Public Health for Nursing Leaders Certificate Program. The program will provide nurses and midwife leaders with strategies and tools to strengthen health systems, manage population health, and contribute to reforming regulations and policies as they relate to local, regional, and global health systems. But before Dr. Karowski begins his address, I would like to take a moment and thank the Burdett Trust for Nursing and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for their enduring support of our program, including their funding support for this important program. I also want to thank our partners in, of the program, and these include the Africa Union, the African CDC, and the World Bank Group, as well as our Harvard partners, the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I also want to thank all of you. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to our vibrant and meaningful and fruitful conversation. I now would like to turn over to Dr. Kowalski to provide the keynote address. And thank you again. Over to you, Dr. Kowalski. Thank you, Dean Williams for the kind introduction and thank you all for joining today's workshop. I'm delighted to share with you today some key findings of our work on the macrofiscal implications of the COVID-19 crisis on health spending. Before that, however, let me step back for a second and clarify some of the key premises of this work. First and foremost, getting over the economic crisis will require re resolving the health crisis. And the recovery from the health crisis will require three things. First, end the pandemic, most importantly through the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. Second, prevent future health crises through strengthened health security. And finally, regain losses in coverage with essential non-COVID-19 health services. Over the next few minutes, I will show you that this health recovery is at risk because of widening rifts in health spending. To do so, I will briefly highlight some key features of the economic and fiscal outlook, demonstrate some of the consequences for health spending, and then show the implications for the recovery from the health shock. So let's turn to some of the macro fiscal features of the recovery. Here we draw mostly on data from the World Economic Outlook of the International Monetary Fund. The analysis is based on the data released in April. The IMF just updated these data and we are still scrutinizing them. For now, we don't see much change, but please stay tuned. You will probably have seen such a figure before. It shows the growth trend of GDP per capita. The good news is the strong return to growth in 2021. On average, across all countries, GDP per capita is expected to grow by 2.1%. Two points are important to recognize though. First, different from the global financial crisis, the great lockdown affected all income groups, including low and lower middle income countries. Second, after the deep contraction in 2020, the recovery starts from a low base and most countries will only reach pre-COVID GDP per capita levels in 2023. This is two years from now. The return to growth is critical, but also the ability of countries to build out key public investment. In our analysis, we see large disparities among countries. We use a simple metric. What is the expected per capita general government spending in 2026? five years from now. By then, will it exceed pre-COVID-19 levels or will it fall short of them? When we apply this benchmark, we see a group of 126 countries where general government per capita spending will be above pre-COVID levels in 2026. This is a favorable outlook, but not without challenges. For example, despite the generally positive trend in spending growth, the lower income countries in this group are expected to go through one or two years of cuts in general government per capita spending. And then there's a group of 52 countries 
where general government per capita spending will remain below pre-COVID-19 levels in 2026. In this group, the ability to build out key public investments will be highly constrained. For example, the lower income countries in this group are expected to cut back on general government per capita spending on average in four out of the five next years. So how will this outlook, fiscal outlook, impact health spending? We developed various scenarios. Today, I want to focus on two. Both look at government per capita spending on health as the most crucial source of health funding. In the first scenario, we analyze how per capita government health spending will develop if governments hold the share of health in their spending content, constant. You can think of this as the business as usual scenario. The priority given to health in budget decisions does not change, and government spending on health will be driven by the size of the overall government resource envelope. In the second scenario, we assume that the positive pre-pandemic trends in per capita government health spending will continue in the future. We consider this an optimistic scenario. However, it is important to bear in mind that in most lower income countries, these past trends were insufficient to meet targets for universal health coverage by 2030. The scenario analysis demonstrates how the large disparities in countries' capacity to build out key public investment will likely result in severe rifts in government health spending across countries. Although not without challenges, the outlook for the group of 126 countries with expected growth in general government per capita spending is quite favorable. In contrast, the prospects for the 52 countries with no expected growth in general government per capita spending are dire. Let me explain why, using low-income countries as the example. In the first scenario, the constant health share of budget scenario shown in blue, per capita government spending on health will drop from $14 in 2019 to $12 in 2026. In the second scenario, the pre-COVID trend scenario shown in orange, per capita government spending will increase from $14 in 2019 to, 12, to $25 in 2026. In sum, if governments hold the share of spending on health constant, future spending levels will fall far short of pre-COVID trends with stark gaps between the two scenarios. This begs the question whether a return to pre-COVID-19 per capita government health spending trends is feasible. In short, for most countries, the answer is no. For example, for low-income countries, this means on average doubling the share of government spending going to health from 10 to 20%. Increases of this magnitude over such short periods of time are unprecedented. In a new piece of analysis, we wanted to better understand what these spending outlooks mean for the ability of lower income countries to finance the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines and the necessary investments to strengthen health security. Let me turn first to the case of the vaccination rollout and illustrate the finance, findings using the example of low-income countries. In a first step, we estimate the growth in government spending on health above and beyond pre-COVID-19 levels. We focus on growth in spending, assuming that pre-COVID spending levels are critical to maintain coverage with essential non-COVID-19 health services. We combine spending growth estimates for 2021 and 2022, as this is the desired period for the rollout. We then compare these projections against estimates for the country's cost share of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. These estimates reflect the cost above and beyond currently available support from COVAX, as well as vaccine donations. To attain a population coverage of 70%, the country's specific cost estimates in low-income countries amount to roughly 4.3 billion. In the constant health share of budget scenario shown in blue, 
The projected growth in government health spending in 2021 and 2022 will cover only 28% of the country's cost share of the vaccination allowed. Please also note the stark differences depending on the expected growth in general government spending. This general outlook does not change much under the optimistic scenario that countries return to pre-COVID government health spending growth rates. Additionally, generated government resources for health will cover only 44.5% of the country's share of the vaccination rollout. The forecast for lower middle income countries is very similar. Also here, the growth in government spending will on average cover only a fraction of the country's cost share of the vaccination rollout. Let me now turn to the ability of lower income countries to finance the investment needed to strengthen health security. In this case, I will use lower middle income countries to illustrate the general findings. The logic of the analysis is very similar to the one I just presented for the vaccination rollout. First, we estimate the incremental government spending on health now for 2026. We then compare these estimates with the annual costs of strengthening and maintaining preparedness and response capabilities. We use highly conservative country cost estimates. On aggregate, they amount to 4.4 billion in 2026. In the constant health share budget scenario, shown again in blue, growth in government spending on health will cover on average only 61% of the annual costs of necessary improvements in health security. Also here, this picture does not change much, even if countries make the bold choices necessary to return to pre-COVID growth trends in government spending on health. In conclusion, most lower income countries will be unable to mobilize the additional funds necessary to cover their cost share of a vaccination rollout or the cost of strengthening preparedness and response, let alone the costs of both. They will find themselves in a catch-22. The likely outcome is sluggish progress in the vaccination rollout, little improvements in health security, and at best, stagnation on the road to universal health coverage. Such a response would pose grave risks to full recover from the COVID-19 double shock, both health and economic, not only in these countries, but globally. As demonstrated earlier, this dire outlook does not change much even if countries take bold actions to increase the priority given to health and government spending. Yet these actions are vital to prevent lasting damage from spending cuts to health systems. Lessons from past crises suggest that there are few spending categories that tolerate cuts without doing major harm to health systems, at least in the short term, for example, administrative budgets and capital spending. However, in past crises, countries had all too often no choice other than reducing spending on categories that affect its most important asset, the people working in health, either directly through adjustments of the wage bill or indirectly through cuts on items that leave health workers without the means to provide quality services like medicines and medical supplies. We see these patterns starting to repeat themselves in health budgets in 2021. Looking forward, it is critical that policymakers fully, makers fully appreciate the intended and unintended consequences of any cuts in spending on the performance of the health system. In addition to these domestic efforts, development assistance for health can bridge the widening health spending rifts. It has been stagnant in the years pre-COVID and may not be easy to boost now, at a time when high-income countries are also struggling to maintain their levels of government spending. Yet high-income countries have a vital interest in reinforcing a global recovery. By recognizing this interest and backing it with resources, donor countries can bridge the widening rifts in health spending. As the multilateral task force on COVID-19 has stressed, the time for action is now. The course of the pandemic and the health of the world are at stake. And with that, as I highlighted at the beginning of the presentation, also a sustained global economic recovery. 
Again, thank you, Dean Williams and Stephanie Ferguson for this opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Kowalski for being with us today. Uh, his presentation was fantastic. And so I am going to connect some dots with this presentation as we move forward to, with our panel discussion. I also want to thank once again, Dr. Kowalski on behalf of Dean Williams and myself. We really appreciate the fact that he took time to be with us this morning. And I hope you learned a lot from his presentation. Uh, we are recording this event. Um, my name is Dr. Stephanie Ferguson. If you haven't already realized that, I am the director of the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program. We are gonna pivot now to the health financing and times of pandemics panel. I am the moderator and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our esteemed colleagues that will be joining me today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Peggy Bedeau, who is the Minister of Health of Seychelles. She holds a master's degree in health services management from the University of Manchester. Her career in health began in nursing practice followed by several senior positions at the Ministry of Health and Community Health, Nursing Education, Directorate of Nursing, and latter part in health management and policy de development. Throughout her career, she has been an active nurse and midwife. She was the founding member of her National Nurses Association in Seychelles. She went on to, at a global level to be the president for eight years at the Commonwealth Nurses and Midwifery Foundation. She was also the founding president of the East, Central, and Southern African College of Nursing, which as many of you know, it's a professional body which brings together nurses from 14 countries with the main aim of strengthening the nursing and midwifery profession. profession. She is also honorary fellow, <coughs> excuse me, of the Royal College of Nursing in the United Kingdom. She spent many years at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London where she was the head senior advisor for health. In that role, she was in the health section in the social transformation programs division. We call that STPD. She was responsible for human resources for health and maternal and child health and non-communicable diseases. She's been at the forefront of change. We are blessed to have her with us today. She was an advisor for many years, starting in 2012 with the Minister of Health then and then Principal Secretary of Health. And now she is a Minister of Health. The other thing that I just wanna say about her that is, goes along with health financing in the work she was an innovator and a creator and founder of the National AIDS Council in all of Africa, specifically through the African Health Professional Regulatory Collaborative, with, which we call ARC, which she in, initiated together with the CDC. And she's a strong component during those times where she switched out the treatment to care for the people from the doctors to the nurses to better combat HIV and AIDS. She's still on the battlefield and she's still with us today and she's gonna share her story and her successes in her country. I'm not so sure that Dr. Naima al is on the phone with us yet. Um, I don't think she is. There has been quite a bit going on in Africa today. Um, many issues with roaming electricity out. And so I'd also like to introduce Dr. David Benton, who's gonna join me. Uh, many of you know Dr. Benton. He took up the post of the CEO of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing uh, in 2015. But prior to that, he worked for more than 10 years at the International Council of Nurses in Geneva, Switzerland. He was the CEO. And before he was the CEO at ICN, he was the consultant on nursing and health policy, specializing in regulation, licensing, and education. And so David is the premier scholar in regulation and health policy in our world. And it's a great honor for him to be with us today because he's also gonna tell his story in the context of the questions I'm gonna ask them. So without further ado, I am going to go forward now with my moderating questions. And um, I, I hope you enjoy this. Once again, this is being taped and um, it just, it makes me happy when I'm able to introduce to you nurse leaders who are at the forefront of making a change right now for all of the nurses and midwives in the world. You know, when I think of David Benton, David Benton is on the WHO 
advisory committee now for health professionals. And when I think about Dr. Peggy Vidot, she has been at the forefront of really making a difference and showing people what to do in times of pandemics. Thank you for providing your, your insights and challenges throughout Africa and the world. I have been following you and I think that many people on our video today have. One of the things that you might have noticed for those of you listening to me, Dr. Karowski told us both of your countries, and when I say your countries, I'm talking about Seychelles and Dr. Naima al and her role as representative for Egypt. Both of those countries in Africa are, are fortunate because they have a favorable and indeed highly favorable macro fiscal outlook. So we'd love to hear uh, your insights, starting with Minister Vido, and then from there, we will go to Dr. Ben. But Minister Vido, welcome to Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health on behalf of Dean Williams, and welcome to the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program. I turn the platform over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. I'd like to thank you and Dean Williams for inviting me to participate in this important workshop at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. It is indeed a privilege as a nurse and midwife, uh, as a nurse and midwife leader, to be a partner with the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program. I'd like to bring your greetings from the Seychelles. Seychelles is a small uh, country, and it consists of about, um, as an archipelago, about 115 islands, uh, just about 1,500 kilometers off the east coast of Africa, uh, really in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It is uh, small, with only a total land mass of about 443 kilometers square. Uh, but the country's exclusive uh, economic zone covers a much, much wider uh, area of about 4.4 million kilometers square. And it is found in one of the world's major fishing grounds. The three main islands of the Seychelles are Mai, Pral, and Ladig, and they are permanently inhabited and host the bulk of the economic activities. And uh, the small capital is Victoria, and this is situated on Mahe. Uh, which is the largest island. The other islands are very, very sparsely inhabited and many of them are just uh, tourist facilities. The estimated population is small, about 100,000. Uh, and uh, though you know, the, the growth has been uh, quite steady at 0.07%. And uh, the population is uh, reasonably young with 22%. Uh, uh, age between uh, below 15 and about 12% uh, percent age above 65. Um, as all other seeds, Seychelles face numerous challenges due to its small uh, population size, small land mass and remote geography. Most of what is consumed on the islands come from external markets due to its narrow resource base. At the same time, costs for imports and exports are high due to remoteness from international markets and high transportation costs. And this recently has gone up even more. The country relies on a service-based economy, namely tourism, and in recent years, financial services. There is a limited scope for this diversification of the economy, and the country remains vulnerable to global economic shocks. The situation was highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, which resulted in worldwide travel res restriction, and this severely affected the local tourism industry, causing a massive depreciation of the Seychelles uh, currency against all international currencies, and really a uh, very high increase in the cost of living. As I said, we depend heavily on tourism, and when we look at uh, prior to COVID in 2019, we were registering about 300,000 tourists per year. And in 2020, we didn't even have 100,000 visitors to Seychelles. It seems to be picking up now. Uh, as of September this year, uh, we've had about 115,000 tourists visiting. And uh, obviously this has affected the economy tremendously 
when you consider that on average a, a visitor would spend about seven uh, 1,700 US dollars, and uh, this would in 2019 have sort of pulled in about uh, 589 million dollars just for tourism. And when you look at what we're pulling out in, in now at only about 100,000 tourists, you know you can see the kind of uh, uh, economic uh, in difficulties that we have had. You know we're going through as a result of COVID. Uh, um, the Ministry of Health um, is responsible for uh, most of the health uh, delivery in uh, in Seychelles. It um, employs about two thousand um, just two thousand hundred um, employees and has a budget which is about the equivalent of about one hundred and fifteen uh, million US dollars. While I agree we have a favorable macro fiscal outlook, we are not out of the woods yet. Um, however, when looking at uh, how, we, how we struggled during the, the pandemic, we needed to really uh, put in a lot of several key strategies in place. And this, this I believe have helped some of the successes we've been able to do. Um, well, if I can just uh, share these with you in a nutshell, and here I'm not referring to our double coconut uh, shells we have in Seychelles, which is unique to Seychelles, but in, in, a, in, in small pack and see, um, we uh, work with citizens, with visitors, with partners, both inside the country as well as partners abroad, including diaspora, to shore up our financing. We continue to collaborate as we move forward in, uh, in, in you know, to a more endemic uh, COVID-19 states. So if I can outline some of the steps we need to, which I hope will be helpful to others. In building and sustaining strategic partnership, we felt that this was key to ensure our health financing in the time of the pandemics and in any other global health security event. You know, either infectious or natural, you know, diseases or natural disaster. This is especially so for small island states with so many vulnerabilities. When COVID um, hit us in uh, December 2019, well, in March uh, 2019, we, uh, no, December 2019, we had our first case in, in March 2020. And uh, in uh, December 2020, we had our first case of uh, community transmission. Uh, I had to make many, many difficult choices to ensure that we had sufficient PPEs on the island, to look at uh, how we can access vaccine, which we saw as a major tool in, in the fight uh, um, against COVID, and looking at uh, what we had as human resources and everything else that were needed in terms of uh, managing the pandemic. Uh, the government did set up a COVID uh, trust fund and ask citizens and partners um, to uh, contribute to that. This initiative was very well received. We work with all our bilateral partners, such as the government of UAE, India, China, and uh, we managed to secure uh, COVID-19 vaccines through this collaboration and this was very early on in 2021. We could not wait for COVAX, which we were finding difficult to get on because uh, um, of all the uh, administrative things. For us, we, we needed to try and get back the economy back on track. The clock was ticking and the process for COVAX was cumbersome and as well as expensive for our small uh, economy. And uh, so the COVID Trust Fund resources allowed me to purchase PPEs, to uh, look at reagents, and to bring in additional equipment required for testing, and to pay facilities required for isolation of uh, positive cases, to you know all the other expenses such as paying at, uh, staff additional allowances for working uh, extra and uh, other um, investment we needed to roll out uh, a rapid vaccine campaign. During the surge, uh, we found that we were running out of uh, you know, our commodities such as uh, oxygen 
And in a small island, you know, we couldn't sort of drive across the border to try and get this. So we needed to bring in uh, additional oxygen plant into the country. And this was in itself was a major feat because borders were closed. And, uh, but we managed to bring in two additional um, oxygen plant, which were donated again by lateral partners. And that helped us in, you know, in uh, really a massive way. We, facilities were being overwhelmed. The number of admissions were many, and we had to put, quickly put in, put up a, a, a facility. And uh, again, the fund assisted us to put up a facility very quickly in 17 days to convert a, an army facility into a 40 bedded uh, COVID hospital. These are a few things that we did, but we continue to innovate because as I said, our number one industry is, is uh, tourism. And uh, you know, we need to try and get back to pre-COVID stage to bring in, because on average, you know, we'll say about $510 million we bring in just from visitors. So uh, the need to get back to that is really you know, massive. And uh, coupled with all this, we're already feeling the impact of climate change. As an uh, island state, Seychelles is vulnerable to climate, climatic phenomena, especially those associated with rising global temperatures, such as extreme weather events, rising sea levels, and this poses a threat of advanced, adverse events such as flooding, which we've had our fair share of because of the, some of the low-lying areas, the coastal erosion, storms, and heat waves. Uh, we've had, uh, we just out of the tropical cyclone uh, zone, but with the adverse um, weather events, we find more and more that we're being uh, affected, you know, by cyclones, which eat normally the neighboring islands, such as Mauritius. And uh, we find that uh, as we move on with, uh, it, we, it, looking at the effect of climate change, this is going to impact not only on the health sector, but also on the tourism sector, because coastal erosion is really at the moment very evident in many areas. And uh, it poses an existential threat to the country through loss of territory, through loss of uh, beaches, which is uh, what uh, is a major attraction to visitors. And, uh, and whatever efforts we can put up to combat uh, uh, climate change uh, is often seen as sometimes unsightly, but above all expensive. And uh, as a tour tourist destination that rely on beaches and sea as attractions, we have begun to adversely uh, feel the impact. The unpredictability of our weather patterns increasingly poses risks affecting how the destination is perceived and uh, possibly likely to make it less attractive. And uh, we also know that it's causing, causing health, as brings in health risk, especially as a result of flooding, impact such as increase in water and vector-borne diseases. The response of the tourism industry as a result of climate change is difficult to predict. They include a drop in demand, especially for long distance travel, and this, in a way, will depend on policy changes in developed countries, including increased taxation on travel, which could make long distance travel more expensive. So as a country, we need to be creating opportunities to look at you know, the group of visitors that we will be able to continue to call up. So all of this with COVID-19 pandemic, we had to do a rapid response, Stephanie, to ensure success and financial uh, viability. We needed to make difficult choices on opening up the borders, allowing visitors in, running a risk of uh, increased uh, transmission in the country. But with a, a good um, vaccination rollout, we managed to do this and uh, it has allowed our economic activity to alleviate some of the diff economic difficulties we faced. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. You know, I love saying that, Minister Vidot. Uh, that was exactly what we needed to hear. 
It gives us a lot of strategies around Africa and the world. And I would like to say that because you are a nurse and a midwife, you can see how your country is still on, uh, doing very well in difficult times like these. I'm going to come back to you, but I'd like to pivot now to Dr. David Benton because I'd like for him to also share the strategies that he has been working on around the world with health workforce issues and regulations. So David, I turn it over to you now. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. And uh, like Minister Bideau, I also want to thank uh, Dean Williams and the Harvard uh, T.H. Chan School for this opportunity. Um, as, as I listened to our first speaker, one of the things that uh, came immediately to mind and in the discussions I've had with nursing leaders from around the world is the need to actually understand beyond the nursing community, the impacts that are um, on the agenda of the parliamentarians and of ministers. So understanding the financial uh, context is very important as nurses in terms of understanding how we can best contribute to moving forward the, uh, the agenda. Many of the nursing family, uh, both the professional associations, the regulators and the educators, have come together in countries uh, like never before. They have put their individual interests aside and focused on the needs of the population. And that is really a, a population perspective that is very important, because if one is left behind, we are all left behind. And therefore, we need to think about how we can work it as a team to move the agenda forward. So we saw through the disruption, a disruption to education systems, a disruption to family life, a disruption to healthcare, And it was only by coming together that we were actually able to come up with new ideas in terms of how uh, these systems could be maintained through very, very challenging times. Understanding the contribution that nurses can make and the capacity that we have is critically important. And one of the issues that has been highlighted as a result of the pandemic is the inadequacy of our current workforce models and the data that we have available to us so that we can then deploy uh, those resources wisely and actually have the largest impact for the most people uh, that we have uh, responsibilities for caring for. So I when I talk to colleagues in all different parts of the world, they are very mindful of the fact that that workforce data piece is not fit for purpose at the moment and something that they all need to work together on to make sure that they know um, the capacity that we have and how it is configured across a nation. Um, as as, as, as um, Minister Vidot indicated, um, the geography of her nation and the geography of many nations is complex. There are urban centres, but in many countries, there are large rural expanses and the need to provide services in those areas was highlighted very clearly during the pandemic. This, in, this provided the opportunity to use new technology and we embraced that and nurses were providing services in ways perhaps that they had never done so in the past. This triggers another thought in terms of how we need to prepare the next generation of nurses in terms of these new skills that will enable us to deploy services in a much more agile way. Another area that uh, colleagues were working on as part of this was actually recognising that quite often nurses um, are prepared uh, with an education, but within their institution, they're not able to work to their full scope of practice. And what we saw was legislators in many countries sweeping away some of the barriers to working at full scope of practice. These are um, opportunities that we should not squander and we should take advantage of enabling nurses to work to that full scope. Because not only were they there to provide services during the pandemic, but in many nations, many patients, there is a backlog of all of the other care that needs to be offered. And that is another aspect in terms of planning for the future. 
Now, of course, there was some good news in the middle of all of this. The World Health Organization launched for the first time the State of the World Nursing Report and subsequently launched the new uh, Strategic Directions document. Um, both of these documents, if you haven't read them, I think it's important to read because they make connections to the economic uh, uh, climate but also to a much wider public health climate that needs to be considered as we move forward. Because more of the same is not going to be adequate for the challenges that we face ahead. We have got to be creative and innovative, and that will require nurses to work with a much wider range of stakeholders. And we heard Minister Vido talk about the importance of that collaboration across sectors, across nations, but also across the clinical team as part of that. The Strengthening Nursing um, a New Strategic Directions document from the World Health Organization that was uh, launched during the recent World Health Assembly focuses on four uh, very broad um, but important issues. Education, jobs, leadership, and service delivery. Dealing with one of those in isolation will not give the solutions we need. And therefore, as nurses, we need to think about how all of those interface with one another and that we take advantage of programs such as this to develop the leadership skills needed to enable us to address fully the education, the job and the service challenges. As we look at the work that is laid out in that document, uh, four major areas, 11 specific uh, themes in there. There are many things that nurses can do, but they can't do it in isolation. So we need to actually embrace a much wider group of stakeholders in forming solutions. We need to understand how the work that we do as nurses can contribute to some of these other agendas and, and Minister Vidot highlighted the, the broad range of issues from climate change uh, to the economics, to education, et cetera. And we actually need to think about that because successful policy influence is often derived by nurses making a contribution, not necessarily within the health field, but across a much wider field, which ultimately benefits health. Much of the research that has been done by the World Bank highlights the importance of equity and the importance of education and the importance critically of the education of women. And as we know, many nurses around the world are in fact women. And therefore, if we think about the opportunities we have to influence those agendas, as well as the healthcare agenda, then we will truly have a very strong policy voice. The final point I would want to make before I hand back to, to you, uh, Dr. Ferguson, is that the, the G20 report highlights the importance of policy and the importance of regulation. We need to actually look critically at how we regulate health professions. The model that we currently have was de developed over 100 years ago and was developed at a time when we actually had an industrial era. Many of us in those days would be born, we would marry, we'd have children, uh, and we'd die in the same village. That's no longer the case. We're now living in a digital complex society. So regulation that is fit for purpose is a real challenge for us as we move forward and has to be one of the key solutions to, uh, to liberating the capacity of the nursing profession to, to address the public health challenges and the economic challenges that we currently face. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk today. Excellent, Dr. Benton, as always. Um, you knocked that out of the park. Both you and Minister Vido, it's just fantastic to have you on this panel today. I have one final question that I'm going to go to Minister Vido, and then I'll come back to you, Dr. Benton. And it, it, it relates to Africa, and it relates to Africa in the context of what's going on now with the G7 and the G20. 
Dr. John Nkegason would have been with us today and you know he is doing great things around the world. But I love the recent um, op-ed that he wrote uh, with um, the president of MasterCard about the concept of equal vaccine access isn't charity, it's our best tool. And so Minister Bedell, what are your recommendations for what needs to be invested in right now in Africa so that we can turn the curve. Because as Dr. Kurowski said, we're in dire straits. And Dr. Tedros has been clear, if we don't have the will as a whole planet to deal with this pandemic, to prepare our plans, to also think about climate change, which is gonna do us in, I would argue way before the next infectious pandemic, we've got to get it together. What's your recommendations? What do we need to call on all these other organizations, these multilateral and bilateral organizations to do right now in Africa? Thank you, uh, Dr. Ferguson. Well, I think there's been so many lessons learned from uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. And, uh, and for many, many countries in Africa, we've had to sort of uh, handle all of this and uh, hoping that we are learning from it. Uh, I guess the first lesson that sort of comes out is uh, the, um, the strength of our health system to respond to such pandemic. How uh, we really need to uh, relook at investments in health on the continent. And uh, in, in relooking, look at uh, ensuring that uh, we have uh, systems in place to actually handle many of these things. We know, for example, uh, many of the health systems are not resilient to what, you know, sufficiently resilient to handle you know, such pandemic. And this also, it's not only within Africa, but possibly most systems across, uh, across the globe um, you know, have difficulty in being able to uh, mount an effective response and uh, find itself able to handle uh, the um, number of uh, infected cases in the country without overwhelming of the system. So we all need to ensure that we put in strategies to strengthen health system. And, um, and this speaks to all, all the uh, different pillars of uh, health systems from infrastructure and, uh, and supply chain. And supply chain for me, you know, from a small country, in, you know, means that we have to relook at things. You know, whilst we could say we could handle, we could get on with a, um, X, you know, three months or six months worth of supply or stock, you know, the fact that this pandemic showed that we were cut off completely and uh, to ensure that we have a, a stockpile sufficiently in country, this in itself proved to be a problem. So countries in Africa really need to be looking at uh, all of this. And uh, we need to be, you know, as um, Dr. Benton has said, uh, looking at human resources. And here again, I'm referring to my country where we uh, can no longer look at uh, just numbers, but we need to be able to look at what skills, what skill sets we have, where they are. So that in, in such instance as a, a pandemic, we quickly know what we have, and it makes the deployment plan a lot, a lot easier to know what skills you need where and to be able to, uh, to uh, send those skills. So in moving forward, this is really, really very important. We need to be, especially for small island states, and here I know in Africa we have about four or five, where we have to be looking at uh, really multi-skilling of our workforce because we can no longer rely on the nurse being able to do just this. We need to be looking, you know, uh, Dr. Benton again has mentioned regulations. What can this, uh, what can the nurses and midwives do, you know, and expand that scope, ensure that they have the required education and uh, training to be able to get them to do uh, those um, activities all within a regulated uh, manner so that the service can be safe. But we have to be able to have multi-skills because in such a pandemic, 
you know, we have to rely on different uh, people uh, being in, in different places. So, um, and all this was sort of more about looking at uh, making health systems more resilient. But I think above all, we all need to ensure that we have a level of funding that would permit us to come up with a rapid response. And, um, and for this, I feel in Africa, we need to have access to a regional governance and financing structure, which will build capacity in global governance and financing. This needs to be scaled up to address the complexity of the global challenge. And there needs to be uh, more global funding mechanisms, which uh, countries in Africa can access. There needs to, you know, we need to, to, to harness all these things. And uh, I think within this pandemic, we have been able to rely on the African Union and the African CDC as strong partners in being able to uh, come up with assistance by looking at different ways of assisting countries with investments so as to uh, uh, mount a more effective response. So uh, I feel they would be ideally suited to help us make this happen. And if we establish these types of mechanisms in Africa, it will be a, a, a real um, important step, an essential one to uh, transform and to look at how um, funds can be uh, distributed, you know, so as to ensure that you know, we have a rapid response and uh, all countries are affected. Because as we said, you know, um, no one is safe until everybody is safe. So we have to ensure that all countries, you know, really um, get the kind of assistance so that effective pandemic response can be attained on the continent. And uh, as we look at this, you know, this might work for Africa, but it could also extend to, 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 to uh, regions outside of Africa. And uh, I believe maybe that the model, you know, can be one which could be used worldwide. And uh, in also, you know, the G20 report does sort of um, make recommendation towards that. And I feel if this could, you know, could come in, it would really help, you know, in future pandemics. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. No, this is excellent. This is what we want to hear. We need to strengthen our health systems. We need to come up with a plan. And right now, we can't await until this pandemic is over. So I like all that you talked about with the governance structure, with Africa having its own mechanism through the African Union and with the Africa CDC to, to prepare and, and move us forward. Africa is an example that can be used across the world for what we need to do moving forward. And also in the context of climate change. David, I'm turning it over to you, Dr. Benton, for the last comment in the context of all of this. What now, what next, David? So I think one of the things that we should definitely not forget about is the role of the citizen themselves in helping us address this terrible pandemic. The behaviors of people are critically important in terms of addressing some of the problems that we have. Um, and we know that within many countries, some of the fundamental issues like running water is not available to enable people to, to wash their hands. Um, we know that some people are not wearing masks. These are all steps that can be taken. So I would like to see nursing using its voice to amplify those, those messages where that in itself will actually give a little bit of space for the other issues like vaccine deployment to be implemented. We all have a role to play in this and the public must understand the issues. And I personally believe that nursing is in an ideal position to communicate those messages. Whether you be a Minister of Health, as in the case of Minister Vido, or whether you be a newly qualified nurse or even a student in training, using that trusted voice of the profession 
if you think about the number of nurses there are around the world, that is a powerful movement that can make a difference to help us find our way out of this crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just, if I could just be in, with you right now in person, I'd give you a virtual hug. Um, this was fantastic. I hope that everybody that's on the call right now, who's had the opportunity to be with us since the beginning, uh, Dean Williams knocked it out of the park this morning while we're here today, while we're here talking about <clears throat> the report of the G20, the situation with pandemic preparedness, the impact it's gonna have on all our work as nurses and midwives, the role that we can play as leaders to turn this around and future threats, global threats, and, and issues that are going to be significant in the care that we provide for the people. When I think about Dr. Kowalski, I can't say enough. You know, he was clear in the months ahead, while the world will likely witness the fastest economic growth in the aftermath of any recession in the last 80 years, countries will have to make bold choices to avoid falls in government health spending. When I look at that group of 126 countries per capita government spending and what the projections are in 2026, despite the drops in some nearly um, recent years, specifically the drops we're gonna see this year, 2021 and, and in 2022, we need to focus on the 52 countries who have per capita government spending that is expected to drop and remain below pre-COVID-19 levels by 2026. Without bold choices to increase the priority given to health, per capita government health spending will remain below 2019 levels and will further fall in many of these 52 countries. Many of you on the phone know I always give you homework. We are intentional in this workshop. Figure out what the 52 countries are. It's in the report that I gave to you in the e-portfolio as well as the G20 report. See where your country falls out with this. The other key thing that he said, people will begin the process of cutting. And you know who they're gonna cut first? It's always the people. It's always the health workforce. It's nurses and midwives. It's always the supplies. And we have to think about what we are not gonna allow to be cut and what we are advocate for that we need to protect. To keep their health spending growing at pre-pandemic rates, Governments of the low income countries among the 52 will have on average the double of the share of their spending on health. Think about what I'm saying about that, because guess what? We're in a pandemic and the people are sick. And the other thing is they also have other infectious diseases that they're dealing with and other non-communicable diseases. Um, the other thing that I thought he touched on that was spot on is these and other disparities in the macro fiscal outlook could intensify pre-existing rifts between countries and government health spending in the years ahead with significant disruptive impacts threatening the recovery of uh, the COVID-19. So as we move forward, most, most lower income countries will be unable to finance their share of a COVID-19 vaccine rollout to halt the current pandemic. So let alone invest in better preparedness and response capability. The widening rift will force cash strapped countries to make very tough decisions in health investments. While it won't be easy to boost development assistance for health at a time when <clears throat> some healthy and wealthy donor countries are also struggling, like my own country, the United States of America, high income countries have a vital interest in still supporting a global, global recovery. So my last take home point from Dr. Kowalski is this, progress towards universal health coverage is critical for human capital development and a full return to inclusive growth everywhere. Together with all that was said today by Minister Vido and Dr. Benton, and when we think about all the countries, the 126, the 52 who are not doing well, we have to come together. Countries can bridge the health financing rifts to build a healthier, more secure, and more prosperous future for all. And it's, it's on us to make sure that happens. Thank you for being with us for this moment. 
today, and thank you for being with us this, mo this morning uh, in the United States of America this afternoon for those of you around the world. And now I'm not gonna give you a break. Um, I can't thank you enough, Minister Videau. Thank you, Dr. David Benton. Thank you, Dr. Michelle Williams and Dr. Karowski. And now I'm gonna pivot to the launch of our certificate program in global public health. Um, thank you so much. Now, I'm gonna introduce you once again to two of my colleagues that are gonna be doing this presentation with me. Uh, we are gonna to talk to you about the Harvard Global Public Health for Nurse Leaders Certificate Program. Um, once again, I'm Dr. Stephanie Ferguson. I'm the director of the Harvard Global Nurse and Leadership Program. Dr. David Benton, I've already introduced to you, but just in case you're joining us now, Dr. Benton is the CEO of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. Prior to his work at uh, the NCSBN, as we call it in our country, in the United States of America, he was the CEO of the International Council of Nurses in Geneva, Switzerland, and he also is a premier expert in regulation and health policy and one of our faculty in the Harvard Global Public Health for Nurse Leaders Certificate Program. I'd also like to introduce you to Michelle Bell. Dr. Bell is the Program Manager of the Harvard Global Nurse and Leadership Program. She uh, is uh, no stranger to Harvard, T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She's had various roles since 1999. She retired, and then I'm so grateful that she came back to be with us at Harvard to help uh, not only with the uh, Harvard Global Nurse and Leadership Program, but also with our program, When Health Meets Business, When Public Health Meets Business. It's a great program, and I encourage you to look into it. Prior to her retirement, she was the Assistant Dean for ed Educational Programs. Uh, Dr. Bell is an expert in management and leadership, evaluation and assessment, and curriculum development and accreditation. Next slide, and welcome to David and to Michelle and to all of you listening to me at this point. What we're going to do is talk to you about the target participants that we are looking for to apply for the program. The application process is open as I am speaking to you right now. Um, and we're also going to talk to you about the details, the logistics of the program, the application process, and the courses and the applied projects. I just want to just remind you, our program at Harvard is really based on the science uh, that was revealed in the uh, State of the World Nursing Report in 2020. You heard Dr. Benton talk about this report. We knew before the pandemic that we were in dire straits, that we were not gonna have the number of nurses and midwives, I might say, to be able to care for the world's population. We were down at 5.9 million globally, right at the offset. And then next thing you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we know that nurses have been become sick. Some nurses have died, as well as midwives and other health workers. We know that some have resigned and some are retiring. And so as we move forward, we have to make sure that we strengthen the leadership capacity of nurses and midwives. And so David did a great job talking about the WHO global strategic directions. We can go to that slide. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but what I encourage you to do is to look at and read the Global Strategic Directions for Nursing and Midwifery. They have, there are four priority areas, education, jobs, leadership, and service delivery. Throughout the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program Certificate, we are designing and have worked with our colleagues in Africa to make sure that we touch on all four priorities, especially leadership development. Now it gives me great pleasure to turn the rest of this section um, to Dr. Michelle Bale. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, for this certificate program, I just want to talk a little bit about who we're looking for. And we're looking for government and national chief nursing and midwife officers and regulators, national nursing leaders, academic officers, and other leaders, uh, nurse and midwife leaders across Africa with management and leadership experience who are, as you can see here, responsible for healthcare services, population health, and health policy governance and interventions. In today's globalized world, as we've been talking about this morning, um, and whose work has an impact on the lives of millions of people every day. 
Also, those that are aware of changing nature of public health threats and acknowledge their personal ability to mitigate health risks associated with these situations, they should be able to understand the critical importance of positioning themselves to shape not only healthcare, but also global public health. Initially, we are looking at this cohort to represent countries across Africa. We may take other students, but our focus is on African nurse and midwife leaders. Now, I want to talk specifically about this certificate program details. Uh, the program uh, is nine months in length and 7.5 credits. These are transferable to a new master's degree program um, if students qualify. There are three credit bearing courses uh, within this um, program, one course will be taught remotely, two are will be in-person courses uh, that may have to be adjusted depending on, of course, uh, the issues with COVID-19. It will become, begin the last week of September in 2022 and go through June 2023. There will be three courses offered that will be interlinked and each student will have a project, this applied project mentioned here, that builds from one course to another. This applied project will be mentored by faculty and individually designed by each student regarding something relevant to their work. And we also want to make sure you know that financial assistance is available for this program. And you can find out more information by visiting the certificate website or by contacting us by email. And this information will be provided on the last slide. For the application for this program, uh, it, the application is in SOFAS Express. This is the primary application for all of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health degree programs. Each student will need a bachelor's degree or a non-US equivalent. And we will also need a curriculum vitae, a statement of interest, which I'm gonna talk about in just a little bit more detail in a minute. And then two references, letters of reference that can actually talk about the individual's leadership and potential. Now, English proficiency is required for this. Um, if English is not your primary language, then we require the TOEFL or IELTS. Um, it, and on the website, we have links directly to find out more information about these two specific organizations. Now, um, uh, the statement of interest, just quickly wanted to go over that. It is 1,250 words or less, and you would answer questions first about your organization um, and where you are employed, information about your role within the organization, and then we specifically, and most importantly, want to hear about your present and future responsibilities and development and describe what you are primarily interested in learning in this program. And uh, now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Benton to talk more about the curriculum. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Um, so as you can see, uh, we know that all of you are extremely busy. So we thought it would be very helpful to actually provide some information in terms of what was going to be taught and when it was going to be taught. So you can fit this into uh, your uh, busy schedules. Also information there on the faculty that will be teaching the various uh, modules. It's important to recognize that each of these actually fit together. And as part of the uh, teaching plan, we are taking a, 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 an action learning based approach. Uh, leadership, innovation and negotiation weaves throughout the program and it, it will be linked by the applied projects and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So the idea here is to focus on something that is important to you and your context. It is not simply a case of um, an academic exercise, it's, it's very much about actually helping to support you move forward. So within this, you, what you'll see that, that, that there will be mentorship available to you. You will design 
the project and it will it will actually carry forward. So as part of this process, we will be asking you to think about what are some of the key strategic documents that are in your country at the moment and what contribution you might be able to make to those as we move forward. Um, this is, this is uh, an, an important part of the learning in terms of working and applying the skills and the uh, knowledge that we will be providing through the various modules. Uh, so with that, I now hand back. I know that was very quick, and I know many of you have been with us for quite a bit of time now. I want to thank uh, Dr. David Benton and Dr. Bell for going through the presentation. Here's the deal. Um, get in touch with us. Contact us. You see our global nursing at Harvard at the hsph.harvard.edu uh, email, globalnursing at hsph.harvard.edu. We want you to go online and look at the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program and look at the certificate program. In your e-portfolio, in your reading assignments, I have not only given you the two reports that we talked about today uh, from the World Bank and the G20 report, but I also give you, gave you access to the link to the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program and to the certificate program. I encourage you to look at everything on the link, to think about your essay. I encourage you to apply. I encourage you to also understand that we have scholarships available. And so um, I don't want you worrying about the money at this point or anything. I want you to apply. And I want you, if you need a scholarship, to request a scholarship. Uh, my job is to be here for you, along with Dr. Bell. Um, I will be meeting with many of you in Africa with Dr. Bell and others so that we can go over everything related to the application process. But I just want to thank you for joining us today. And I hope that um, you will consider applying for the program. Um, I will now take down the slides. If you have questions, though, I, please get in touch with us, okay? And most of you have my personal email at Harvard, and you also have our Global Nurse and Leadership Program email. Um, we've had a great day. We've had a great day. And on behalf of Dean Williams, I want to thank all of you for being with us. Once again, we are recording this this. Uh, hour and 30 minute event. It will be on our Harvard Global Nurse and Leadership webpage. Uh, I want to thank our keynote speaker. He knocked it out of the park. Once again, Your Excellency, Minister of Health Peggy Vizzo, I can't say enough about you. And as well, I can't say enough about you, Dr. Benton. I, I tell you, it, I was excellent. And you tied in everything that we need to think about with health financing in the time of pandemics, climate change, and the role of nurse leaders. Uh, one of the core competencies of leadership for nurses is understanding economics, economics and health, health finance, and health financing in times like these, and financial management. So I know that you heard a lot today, but I want you to, as Stephen Covey said, sharpen your saw and your toolbox so you can be beyond excellent with financial management. You've got to understand it. It's the only way that we can articulate the value of nursing by talking about the trends in finance, by being able to do the return on investment by being able to harmonize the budgets and make it so that you can have the right people at the right time with the right resources and the products and the policies to care for the people of our world. This is important. And you know, they're gonna come after us and the first thing they're gonna to wanna to do is we, we're gonna to try to get another cadre of health workers. We're gonna to try to do this. We don't need this nurse here. We don't need this. But it's our job to be able to articulate the value. And know you can do this when you understand finance. So I'm giving you some more assignments. Start reading Financial Times. Start reading The Economist. Start looking at the leaders like Dr. Ngozi at the World Trade Organization, Dr. John Nkegasan. Start following the ministers of health like Minister Peggy Vido, like Dr. Naima Al-Gassia, Al-Gassia, who is the WHO Regional Advisor for all of Egypt. 
follow their lives. Look at our former president of Harvard University, Larry Summers. He was one of the co-authors, along with Dr. Ngozi, of the G20 pandemic report. Look and see what they have recommended. Follow the World Health Organization right now and Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros is coming out strong right now about governance, about the mechanisms we need, about the fact that people are talking and doing a lot of chatter, but there is no motion. There's no will. And until we get the will to be able to deal with this pandemic and move forward in a better way and build back better, and build back and strengthen our healthcare delivery system so we focus on primary health care and public health infrastructure in the context of our health systems, we're not going to turn the curve as fast as we want to and as fast as we need to. So I hope that you have uh, had a good day today with our workshop and we're right on time. And once again, special thank you to the Burdett Trust for nursing, to Shirley Baines, to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for sponsoring the Harvard Global Nursing Leadership Program and also this workshop. Um, we are very excited because many of you that will be accepted to go to our certificate program at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in collaboration with the African Union and the Africa CDC will become Burdett Fellows. And so this is really fantastic. This is a wonderful opportunity in your careers. So once again, on behalf of Dean Williams, we thank you and we wish you well. Take care and stay well. And thank you for being a part of the Harvard Global Nurse and Leadership Program. And also thank you on behalf of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, the, as we say, the Chan family. Thank you.